Okay, good morning. On behalf of the Department of English, University of Gurugram, this is Amit Patacharya, welcoming you to another session of the online lecture series that our department is organizing. Today, we are really proud to have in our midst one of our very loved and revered senior academicians, Professor Lindini Bhattacharya. And today, agreed to enlighten us about the uncanny. The title of her talk is Exploring the Uncanny Literary and Cultural Representation. But before I request Nondini Ji to make her presentation, I must tell you something about Nondini Ji. Professor Nondini Bhattacharya is currently associated with the Department of English and Culture Studies, Bardwan University. She has also taught at Hyderabad Central University and Central University of Jammu. She has got a very distinguished career of research and teaching behind her, actually made daring academic explorations of many fields. For example, two of her books, one is uh, Rabindranath Tagore's Bora, A Critical Companion, and also a translation of Sridhar Kaurada's Modern Fairy Tales. So you can easily understand that range and depth of her scholarship. She is at present the project coordinator of the DRS SAP 2 of her department. And the task is basically that the topic of the project is border and border making. Today Nundini Ji is going to tell us something about the uncanny and we hope to allow the ghosts to make a debut today. So without further ado, let me hand over the reins of this session to the capable hands of Professor Nuthiti Bhattacharya. Over to you, Nuthiti. So, uh, should I start? Yes, please. Okay. So, uh, very good morning and thank you for inviting me over. And it's an absolute pleasure even though physically I have never been to Gourbongo, Shobuj has, I think, called me in a college nearby where I met many of you all. And uh, surely, oh yes, physically too, I had gone once to Gourbongo uh, for uh, Shobuj. But uh, I'm sure uh, after all this contagion is over, uh, I will be going to your university again and meeting all of you all, all of whom are like my younger brothers, a very nice, a very vibrant and young department, well led by Amit Bhattacharya. Now, I would like to begin my uh, talk today, which will be a little informal. You see, uh, with this quotation from Jacques Derrida's Spectres of Marx, uh, as in Hamlet, this was, this was published in 1994, Spectres of Marx. As in Hamlet, the prince of a rotten state, everything begins with the apparition of a specter. More precisely, by the waiting for this apparition, the anticipation is at once impatient, anxious, and fascinating. This is the thing, this thing will end up coming. The revenant is going to come. Now, uh, See, Derrida is necessarily dense, but I would just like to go back a little and talk to you about, uh, uh, you know, the uh, another essay which he wrote in, um, in uh, you know, which he wrote, uh, this is Spectres of Marx, which he wrote in 1994. And another essay which he wrote in 1995, which is called the uh, uh, which is called Maldo Archive, or <clears throat> the, uh, the sickness of the archive, and this is where he is talking about Freud. 
All right. So, uh, and I will go back even further and talk about a uh, an essay in 1919 where, uh, and in the essay on Freud, Derrida is actually talking about entering Freud's house and, and coming across Freud's father's handwriting in a book, and which brings back the specter of Freud's father, which is also the specter of Freud into the domain of the modern world. Now, uh, I would also like to speak about the uh, essay which Freud had written, the only essay which is also a, an essay in literary criticism called Junheimlich, or translated as Uncanny, which was in 1919. All right, and I would also like to go back to yet another uh, uh, two volume uh, published by uh, called the history of spiritualism. This was published by Arthur Conan Doyle in 1926. See, since I don't have a blackboard, I, then I could have put up all these dates, but I'm going to repeat them. 1995 is... Uh, is, is uh, the Maldo Archive. 1994 is Spectres of Marx. 1926 is, is History of Spiritualism. 1919, this is by Arthur Conan Doyle. And 1919 is, the, uh, is Freud's Uncanny. Now, what am I trying to get at, you know, let me make it simple first before I complicate my argument. I am simply saying that the romantic movement was a movement which was engaged with, which was involved with, or which articulated the idea of specters or the idea of uh, the uncanny. All right. So uh, if you take up seminal texts like, uh, say, Kubla Khan or The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner or, uh, say, Wuthering Heights or, uh, or uh, Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, you will find that the uh, specter is very much there. Now, I am making a fairly acute point. I'm not, I'm not saying that it is a feature of romanticism, you know, romanticism, Victorianism. I am simply saying that the specter produces the romantic Victorian worldview, as it were. All right. Now, uh, let us come to this, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's intrinsic, it's essential to the romantic worldview. Now, uh, the, when I am talking about Freud's Uncanny, uh, of course, I'm talking about an essay that I teach in my postgraduate classes. And very simply speaking, it is an essay where Freud is, artic is talking about a a short story by uh, by E.T.A. Hoffman, and this short story is called this uh, Sandman, and it is through the articulation of this short story that Freud is presenting some of the features of the uncanny. Now remember that the word time, which means home or something that belongs to the family, something that is familiar, is, uh, is also heimlich, something that is familiar, something that is known. Nevertheless, the word uh, unheimlich is not the obverse of Heimlich. This is this is the first thing I would like my students to know, that you know it's not its opposite. Unheimlich is a position within the Heimlich. It is when the familiar, when the, uh, when the known, when the uh, comfortable suddenly becomes slippery, when it suddenly uh, becomes something that is frightening, 
That is what we call Yun Heimlich. Now, I would also like to turn your attention to the to the term Yun Heimlich, because I'm sorry, Heimlich, because it also has the additional connotation of being something that is private, being something that is secret. I mean, your home is not for display to everybody. So within that word itself, you have the possibility of a semantic slippage. In other words, you can have multiple significations. I mean, so, uh, Heimlich could very well mean Yun Heimlich. All right. So the word Heimlich uh, accommodates within itself its opposite or its obverse. And this idea of a of a of a of something that is un, uncanny, unfamiliar, this is something that doesn't happen when you see something completely strange. In other words, I mean, let me make this simple. I mean, why are you frightened of a skeleton? All right, just tell me, why are you frightened of a skeleton? You are frightened of a skeleton that moves because it reminds you of the familiar human body of which it was once a part. Because the skeleton is a trace, is a reminder, is a specter of the human body that the skeleton becomes fearsome. All right. So uh, the or or I could refer to Christabel. I mean, where uh, Christabel enters the house, and Je it is only within the house that Geraldine is seen as unfamiliar, as frightening. So what is uh, you know in many fairy tales, you will find that there is often a mother who transforms into an ogre, Rakushi. That is the frightening thing. Somebody who is familiar, who turns into something unfamiliar. So there is always that possibility within a familiar space of that absolutely comfortable, familiar thing suddenly transforming into something unfamiliar. All right, this is the critical point that you have to keep in mind before you enter into uh, the whole idea of how uh, uncanny is deployed in literature. That is what we are going to study today, how uncanny is deployed in literature. I, am, I had begun by saying that uncanny actually produces a literary movement. So the question of it being deployed in literature or in literary text is only a small part of a larger uh, idea that the uncanny produces a literary movement or a cultural movement, which is romantic Victorianism. Anyway, uh, I mean, I don't want to complicate my arguments uh, because this is this is an online lecture, and therefore uh, there should be some amount of clarity. Had we met face to face, I would have had more chance of writing on the blackboard and making myself a little more clear than I am doing right at this moment. Let me again begin with The Uncanny, which was published in 1919 and where Freud is discussing a short story, which is by E.T.A. Hoffman. He was uh, German and like Poe had written and like Rabindranath had written a number of uh, such short stories and uh, narratives which were uh, about this uh, slippery zone between the known and the unknown. All right. Now, again, I will give you another example of, of the uncanny because I often find that this is this is confusing. I will refer to Rovindranath's Jivito uh, Mrito, uh, which is something all of you may have read. Now, Jivito Mrito is about a a, a woman uh, who is a widow and as she's a widow without a child or a husband she's not very welcome in the house so when she is about to die everybody is more than willing to uh, take her away to the burning heart unfortunately even though she has had a heart attack she has not quite died 
So when uh, she wakes up in the cold of the night, the people who have come to burn her run away considering her to be a ghost. Now she now inhabits this liminal zone between death and life. And that is the terrible thing. Even though she is alive, she's taken as dead. And wherever she goes, like she goes to her friend's house, her Shoi's house, she is seen as dead. She's perceived as dead. That is the uncanny moment. You see, the fact that she's seen as dead, but she's living. It is this slippage that creates that sense of uncanny. Finally, Kadumbini, she, uh, uh, you know, goes and commits suicide when she comes back to her original marital home and nobody is willing to accept her as a human being. And the famous lines, Moriya Praman Korilo She Mare Nai, but the problem still remains. I mean, that she did not die is something that is proved by her death. But, or is it? I mean, I leave this question to you. I mean, you know that there is nothing that is proved. Did she die before? Did she die afterwards? Was she living? Was she not? All right. It is within this very homely, inconsequential figure of a Brahmin widow in a village house that the uncanny can suddenly strike. All right. Now, uh, the uh, I, I uh, the, in in the uncanny there is the there are references to things that uh, you know make you feel uncanny. One would be the phobias. All right. These phobias are not just fears, but culturally conditioned anxieties. For example, somebody can be claustrophobic. I mean, and that person is claustrophobic because millions before her have also been claustrophobic. So when she's stuck in a lift, she is aware of such claustrophobia that has hit many people before her. So her fear is doubled by the fear about claustrophobia, which she knows about, all right? So it's the cultural idea of claustrophobia that makes her present claustrophobia even more unbearable. So any phobia has a cultural history, has cultural texture, and therefore it, that is why it's phobic, all right? So the Oedipus complex, it's, it's a phobia. It's a phobia because it's culturally conditioned. The mother's attraction for the young son, the son's desire to finish off the father and replace him in the life of the mother. These are culturally conditioned phobias and therefore they are as much true for a person as they are true for the times or cultures within which that person is embedded. Then again, uh, Freud is talking about uh, the doppelganger. All right. Oh, he's talking about the, uh, you know, the fear of losing eyes and he's talking about the doppelganger. So let us consider these three things that constitute the uh, constitute uncanny. Number one, the uh, doppelganger. Uh, I'm sorry, the phobias. Number two, the doppelganger. And number three, the uh, the fear of losing eyes, which Freud also calls the castration complex. Now, in this story, which which is by E.T.A. Hoffman, Sandman, the Sandman figure is itself doubled. It is a figure from the folklore, German folklore, and there are two avatars of this Sandman. There is one who gently puts golden showers on a child's eye and makes the child go to sleep. And there is yet another that is a mischievous uh, Sandman who puts hot coal or plucks out the eyes of children who stay awake. Now it depends on what kind of a story a child is told. In all probability, Nathaniel has been told the other story of the mischievous Sandman who plucks out eyes of children if they do not go to sleep at night. And 
so while the Sandman figure is double, there is, you know, it is a doppelganger figure. There is a dark shadow of the one Sandman behind uh, the other Sandman. Then, of course, there is that gentleman called Coppelius who comes to his father on some business. But uh, I think uh, Nathaniel sort of conflates, you know, he collapses the figure of the father and Coppelius as people who might want to uh, destroy him, who are his enemies, who might want to pluck out his eyes, who are a threat to his masculinity, and he falls into a deep soon. And this phobia, see, remember that this uh, Nathaniel's fears are also culturally conditioned. He is within a cultural ambit where he has heard about a Sandman. So his fear of Coppelius and his fear of Coppelius plucking out his eyes is not an absurd fear, but a fear that has been culturally conditioned, which into which he has been socialized. So that is why I call it a phobia and not a fear. Then uh, later, when he is old enough, he again meets a Coppola who is selling eyeglasses. And he again associates Coppola with Coppelius with the Sandman who loses, who can pluck out eyes. And finally, of course, he commits suicide. There is also the doubled figure of uh, his beloved Clara and Olympia, who is doll like and hypersexed. And it is the hypersexuality of Clara which makes uh, Nathaniel unmanly, as it were. You know, this is another abiding theme in, in, uh, in uh, Freud's. Uh, in Freud's writings. Now, uh, uh, let us sort of, you know, see how this is worked out. These ideas are worked out in Anglophone literature. Okay. Now, while uh, I, I, I had begun my lecture by saying that romanticism is about doubling, romanticism is about exploration of phobias, romanticism is about uh, anxieties, anxieties uh, which cannot be rationally grounded. Now, if this is so, then uh, I believe that, uh, just a minute, I believe that uh, the, the, a good example to discuss would be something like Wuthering Heights and, uh, and, and its twin text, Jane Eyre. Now, Wuthering Heights actually begins with a gentleman who is its narrator, but it begins with his uh, nightmare and his uh, hallucination. So uh, what story is true? Of course, there is Kathy and Kathy, there is Linton and Linton, and uh, there is a Lockwood who is sort of looking into all of this. There are these two houses. So there is a constant doubling of characters and a constant uh, doubling of time. I mean, there is a real time within which all this is happening. And there is a spectral time. There is a time when you are, uh, you know, which you are imagining, which you are hallucinating. I mean, let me just say this, say you're having a, a dream, a nightmare about you uh, not having studied or you having arrived in a examination hall where everybody else has left. I'm sure all of you have had this dream at some point of time. Now, what is the reality of the dream and the reality of the person who is dreaming that dream within that time? What I'm trying to say is that a dream is as true as what you're experiencing in the real world. I mean, there is an enormous amount of slippage between what is tangible, palpable, and what you have imagined. For example, fears, okay? Bhutir uh, Bhoi, you know, the fear of ghosts 
is real. I mean, there are many people who are fearful of ghosts. There are many people who are claustrophobic. There are many people who are fearful of uh, spiders. But is there anything to be fearful of spiders? You tell me. A spider is a little thing and a human being is so big. What is the fear of claustrophobia? After all, the door of the lift, even if it has closed for a while, will open. Okay, what is the fear of heights? It's completely irrational. Nevertheless, the reality of the fear is felt by that human being. That is what I'm meaning that, you know, a phobia acts in double time. It acts as uh, something that cannot be really proved, but something that is operative. Nevertheless, people have medicines for their phobias. People are schizophrenic. So you, I mean, a fear is not entirely intangible. All right. The relation between the palpable, tangible world and our fears and phobias are, uh, are inexorable. I mean, there, there is a very close connection between the two. Now, let me come to the novel that I am very fond of teaching and which I think will, uh, uh, you know, work out what I'm trying to say. I mean, uh, and I would like to end with Derrida's ontology, I, the idea of a haunting and ontology, which are at variance. Ontology would mean something that is there and haunting would mean something that is not there. So bringing these two together. Now, the text that I would like to look at, and Derrida's example is, is Hamlet. I would, I would like to refer to Heather, a movie that many of you might have seen, where there is the uh, father who comes back as uh, Rudar. And uh, there are many ghosts. There are ghosts of the past. There are ghosts of the present. And in Kashmir, things sort of happen in cycles. You see, even today there has been a terrorist attack. So there seems that the past never has a closure. You see, they, they seem to uh, reorient and inform the present in a very, very real way, in a very real way. Now, let me come to, I, and I'm not going to discuss um, Hamlet because it's something I'm sure has already been discussed uh, where you you actually have a ghost of the father, but the, it is also the ghost of the past. And it is also a trace of what his mother and uncle have done. It is also ha Hamlet himself who is reincarnated. It is, it is all sorts of ghosts, all sorts of pasts that come to uh, immobilize Hamlet as it were. Thank you. I have completed my lecture. If you have some questions, then. Actually, uh, we are really grateful for this brilliant lecture. Uh, with the permission of the speaker, esteemed speaker, I would like to throw the uh, session open for questions and comments. Of so, course. if you have any questions, please put it them to uh, ma'am this is shoguj uh, yes i have a yeah thank you so much such a brilliant lecture ma'am and and i was uh, really curious to know uh, when you refer to the skeleton that we really mm. we are afraid of and mm. i do remember uh, since our childhood days in the biologic you know uh, section Classes. for the yes yes, yes, yes. yes. And the skeleton was in you know, hanging there, and mm. and and, and uh, we, we are really afraid of to pass that particular room and just mm. to light up a look. But mm. the question is that when I went to uh, Benares, ma'am, then I mm. found the ogres are there. Mm. Ogres are there, standing a kind of a, a human skull as a bowl mm. in their mm. hand, mm. and uh, and and smearing uh, body ashes over their body. Mm. And, and such kind of presentation. So uh, I find a kind of a dilemma now that uh, mm. presenting death, presenting uh, the kind of uncanny that we all have, 
mm. going to a kind of a crematorium ground mm. finding such people like aghuris who are practicing mm. this kind of a mm. condition so mm. how to connect this uncanny and the practice they do in real life See, even I mean, today uh, subuj uh, uh, my answer would be my response would be that the uh, anybody who is spiritual okay not mm-hmm. only the authorities mm-hmm. anybody who mm-hmm. is spiritual would be uh, fascinated by the interconnections or the continuity of life and death okay mm-hmm. so yes, uh, the uh, hamlet itself uh, is uh, talking to a skull i mean holds a skull in mm-hmm. his hand so the, mm-hmm. the fascination with death and the fact mm-hmm. that one is never completely dead you see hamlet mm-hmm. is alive Uh, as hamlet is alive is alive also as his father so the trait yes. remains so as a spiritual person one mm-hmm. is reverential of the remains of the human body because they also have their life that is that mm-hmm. is the answer the mm-hmm. one never goes away i mean i am uh, you know refuting this binary logic of death mm-hmm. and life of uh, spirit and reason that is what i am i am refuting i am saying that they are in dialogue and in continuum whether one is frightened of them whatever or one is reverential to them it depends on one spiritual uh, you know evolution the auguries are of course evolved they have understood that death and life are interconnected and therefore yes, they yes. have the stuff yeah yes 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 thank you ma'am thank you so thank much you. Ma'am, uh, here is the second question yes. from Priya Das. Yes. And our question is, how does ambience of the uncanny mm. in the novel mm. work over time, or does it change at all? Uh, um, please, please repeat this. Uh, how does ambience mm. of the uncanny ambience of the uncanny, uncanny okay uh. evolve mm. over time? Or does it change? Evolve through times. All right. You know, this is a more straightforward question. and uh, i would say that the romantic period is uh, the period when from which you can actually uh, draw a or chart a genealogy of the uncanny okay uh, so uh, i would sort of begin with i mean the uncanny can uh, perception of the uncanny can only happen when you have belief in reason all right so therefore the enlightenment is the watershed after which uncanny in literature comes that must be understood i mean in an animistic world where you believe that trees have life or human beings have avatars or reincarnation you can't have an uncanny an uncanny is a uh, particular kind of a literary effect a cultural effect that can be traced from 18th century europe all right which is the uh, beginning of the romantic period so very literally i would say the gothic novel the uh, the poetry the uh, the the manifesto that is there in the lyrical ballads wordsworth and coleridge are talking about the familiar making the familiar unfamiliar and the unfamiliar familiar they too are contributing to the idea of uncanny you see they are talking about the heimlich and the unheimlich so uh, wordsworth is going to make the uh, the very familiar into something that is remarkable and uh, coleridge is going to tackle the unfamiliar or unknown into something that is uh, uh, that can be engaged with that can be engaged with so i would say that is the second moment the publication of lyrical ballads the publication of uh, the castle of otranto then the publication of the lyrical ballads and the preface to the lyrical ballads where there is a uh, you know actually a working out of this idea of heimlich and unheimlich of course the sorrows of young werther if you are going to uh, take into account german literature the idea of stress and strain the you know strum and drum the uh, the stress and uh, 
pressures you i would also like to refer to the victorian moment also dickens who which is sort of uh, is full of doubles look at something like great expectations where there is a miss havisham who is taxidermized who is you know living but living in the dead so there are traces of the young girl who has been jilted at the moment of her marriage but it is a moment that she preserves look at someone like um, like uh, david's aunt who is uh, wants a daughter and wants uh, that uh, leaves the house of david copperfield when david's mother needs her support the most because it is that daughter she wants to see in david so these traces remain i mean victorians i am not even talking about you know jane eyre or wuthering heights which deal with uh, nostalgia with hallucination with ghosts with you know two houses one ghostly and the other not so so when jenner uh, says reader i married him the uh, she has already seen that uh, burning of the thornfield hall so i think that that would be the third moment the fourth moment would be and i would include rovindranath within this modernity the fourth moment would be the uh, you know people like poe and the birth of the short story i think the short story is a good vehicle the modern short story is a great vehicle for the uncanny look at stories like nishithe see okay 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 go rovindranath look at stories like um, poe stories most of them nathaniel hawthorne so that would be another moment and of course i would refer to the spiritualist the society for uh, uh the society for uh, psychological research which was uh, prevalent during the turn of the century which tried to deal with the paranormal which tried to deal with intuitions reminiscences coincidences and all the things that you can't define by reason i'm sure all of you have seen something like shottajit rai's um sonar kella where there is a jati shot and one is talking about parapsychology so that is the kind of association that they would have the next romantic moment and i call postmodernism a continuation of romanticism the next romantic movement would be derrida's articulation of ontology Hey, the tracing of uh, of traces. Yes. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Nobunita Pal. Yes. Uh, she wants uh, to know uh, whether phobia is gender specific. Whether phobia yes. is gender specific. Yes. Yes. I think this is a good question. Yes, gender phobia is definitely gender specific because. the woman is the other and she is the phobia all right so in uh, freud the very idea of castration complex is an you know expression of uh, gender phobia so the woman and the very act of sex is uh, seen as phobic and the woman's body is seen as phobic and uh, cause she is the taboo she is the other most of the rup kathas would have a woman as a uh, that unheimlich figure you know one someone the king picks up from the forests and then in the night she transforms into a one over yes i i agree okay, now uh, devalish mukhopadhyay is requesting you uh, to comment on the manifestation of uncanny in trilokonath writing uh in toilokkonath writing there is uh, there are i mean he is dealing with the ghosts in multifarious ways you see but i would simply say that toilokkonath is also talking about ghosts as uh, things of a past and he is laughing like bonkim chandra he is laughing at us at the bhadralok or the 19th century 
Hindu Brahmin who has become a ghost, who is now a past. So in the portion called Skull and Skeleton in Konkavuti, Skull and Skeleton want to open a British company so that you know people come and buy from them and uh, people are frightened of them because they have been rendered obsolete. So this is another very interesting turn of uh, the of of uh, uh, what is known as the uncanny. The in other interesting thing is that Toilokunath is again very very postmodern. So there is a lot of slippage, like the story uh, in Domoruchorit where there is a woman who is has been gulped by the uh, crocodile and is selling. Uh, her vegetables within the tummy of the crocodile. So, you see, there is an element of carnivalesque humor and uh, Tsoilokonath is laughing at uh, what would be Western realism and he's playing around with time and with reality. So that again is, I think it's a funny way. It's a, it's a comic satiric way of, of uh, approaching the uncanny. Yeah, Yun Heimlich. Yeah, there's a last question ma'am yeah. from Shayal uh, and uh, this question is can you say telepathy is also a kind of uncanny experience? Uh, yes, of course it is. Of course it is. Telepathy, um, intuition, these are very important one can uh, you know, uh, these are part of your uh, paranormal studies. These are part of paranormal studies. You see, anything that is uh, uh, that is beyond our five senses, that is uh, uh, that is uh, uh, well part of the uncanny, isn't it? I mean, uh, why just telepathy? Even the ability to say the. Apparently, Vivekananda had the ability to turn pages without actually using his hands. Every, every such action, I mean, that seems like magic, is a training of the mind and the mind that can control matter. This was the part of the great study of the psychic research societies, the psychic research societies, then, you know, this is the one fine point I'd like to make. The psychic, the Victorian psychic research societies or spiritual societies as they call themselves or ghost clubs as they call themselves, did not really believe that there were ghosts. They simply believed that there were some things that science and reason had not yet explored and it was a realm of possibility okay so parapsychology is that sort of uh, you know bridging science it is that bridging science it's a science of the mind i mean when say you are thinking a lot about a your friend and suddenly your friend arrives so what would you call that coincidence or would you call that the power of your mind Okay, so that is something they are trying to explore. What happens to a person when a person dies? Is there a life after death? We have a parapsychologist like Shami Abhedanandu who has written Morone Pare. So you see, they actually took photographs of people who had died and whether the soul is coming out of the mouth. Now, these are of the inquiries. Inquiry is an important word. It's a Kantian word. You are inquiring into realms that the human reason has not yet been able to capture, but hopes to capture. It's not something that is unknowable. Okay, this is a position that is very different from uh, the romantic idea of the unknowable. Okay. Uh, so, Amit sir, uh, should we take more questions? Uh, I can see there uh, two actually, one from Namrata one and the second one from Babu Kramani. Uh, Namrata is asking, uh, could you talk about the uncanny in Victorian poetry? There is a continuation of that in Robin Market. But anything apart from that? Yes, you see, again, I am not uh, the poetry person. 
okay so i will have to victorian poetry of course deals with a lot of mourning why goblin market what about in memoriam okay there are victorian poetry especially tennyson's poetry uh, is always talking about death it is uh, uh, browning's poetry is always talking about death and death is a imminent presence in their poetry so i think one has to look a little more closely at the at victorian desire to uh, preserve to fetishize that which is dead you see by the time one has come to the victorian period i believe that this idea of uncanny becomes something that one wants to museumize so the friend who is dead has to be museumized so miss havisham who's uh, a uh, moment of uh, you know virginal glory is gone must be museumized houses that are old must be museumized so there is as it were a congealing of the dead rather than a more uh, vibrant communion with the dead which happens in the in the 19 early 19th century so i would like to explore this myself and uh, i would like to get back to the question maker because i don't know enough about victorian poetry to uh, i mean what i'm saying is simply off hand okay uh, so the last question is from babu pramani mm. how can we associate the witches in macbeth with the idea of uncan are so can i associate madness yes of course i mean i think the uh, madness is the most uh, palpable way in which one sees uh, the uncanny because uh, a mad person is uh, possibly someone who is not in her senses and is living in a world that is entirely fantastic uh, fantastic okay that person has snapped off links with the real world while we renew our links with the real world every day in the morning okay in the night we might have a private world we might have dreams hallucinations fantasies but we might even imagine ourselves as heroic figures watching movies but when it is in the morning and we have to go for work we come to terms with what is real but what is real is also i mean what i'm trying to say is that there is no such person as a mad person we are all uh, you know to an extent not quite uh, rational because we are imaginative people we are when you are sitting in a class i'm telling this to students and there is somebody sitting beside you and you think she is going to get a 60% and i am not going to get it and you are sitting beside another boy who you think is going to get less than you in the exams what state are you in you are in a state of jealousy in anticipation of another person's success and you are in a state of contentment about another person's failure so your position is a imaginative position you see your happiness or your contentment with regard to the boy who's on your left is a imaginary position and your anxiety with regard to the girl who's on your right is also an imaginative position so because we are mind and body and our mind makes our bodies therefore we are very much creatures of dreams and imaginations which makes all of us mad which doesn't make us you know entirely rational but uh, madness is uh, is uh, is a great and a very complex area uh, and as fuko says uh, when can you say somebody is mad that is when somebody actually says i am mad so you know of course one is reasonable i mean if one can say i am mad is one mad one is in control of one's reason when one says i am i'm mad so who decides who is mad and of course madness is that state where you have 
be delinked, as it were, from uh, the palpable, uh, you know, sensory world, as it were. Yes, anybody, any other questions? Uh, yes, uh, ma'am, uh, there are two more questions. Although, I mean, there are you, uh, Vivek, I told that this is the last question. Uh, can yes. we take uh, two more questions? Yes, 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 yes please. Uh, okay. Uh, Modurima Gopto is asking uh, in connection the uncanny in connection with the animal. So, is the hmm. how do we blend animals and humans, and then what is the status of cannibalism uh, in case they are blended? In the case of animism, cannibalism. I mean, cannibalism. Animal? All right. Yeah. Um, cannibalism is is an interesting idea. I mean, it is something that is fantasized. I guess in in the case of uh, a exploration of uncanny, cannibalism would be a way of uh, destroying your doppelganger. You'd like to eat up your doppelganger, eat up somebody who is just like you. Okay, I would consider the uh, Oedipus's killing of his father as an act of uh, cannibalism. your other and it is a, a very very uh, scary moment it is a you know it is that uncanny moment when he kills his father at the, uh, the conjunction of three roads okay and who is his father his father is his earlier self his father is someone who follows him when he sleeps with his mother so even though he has eaten his father you know within quotes he is some his father still resides in him so cannibalism is a practice which, which still uh, exists in the eucharist when you eat christ's body and you drink his blood uh, this is the uh, the festival of mass but cannibalism here is seen as a way of participating within the heroic body the body of the god but cannibalism as something that destroys your other self is again an interesting idea. It's also an interesting idea that is related to the uncanny. When you are faced with your with your doppelganger and you want to destroy that, eat it up. Yes. Any any other question? last question from uh, Anonia. Yeah, one last question. Anunna Mishra wants to know uh, about some seminal texts in literature that is related to the uncanny. Uh, mm, I, I, I mean, surely she's asking about anglophone texts. Is she? Uh, she hasn't yes, mentioned, I, but, I, but I think yes, that I would think, uh, uh, I think I would, uh, according to my uh, sort of uh, chronology, I would say uh, the castle of Otranto, uh, the um, Kubla Khan, uh, rival of the ancient mariner, the 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 um, uh, definitely definitely uh, most Victorian novels, most Victorian novels. I mean, almost all of Dickens's novels, uh, Charlotte Bronte's novels. Uh, Wuthering Heights, those would be, you know, seminal uncanny texts. The short stories of Poe, those would be uncanny. I would include, I would always recommend Rovindranath. I don't know whether she will consider Bengali texts. Well, are there any other questions? Uh, Amida. Are there yes, any other questions? Hello? Uh, Ma'am, during your lecture, you have mentioned that there are three features of uncanny, right? Uh, mm. That is, one is phobia, the other is mm. doppelganger, and the third mm. one is the fear of losing eyes. You have mm. mentioned is the, you have mentioned the fear of losing eyes as a phobia. What phobia mm. it was, Ma'am? I missed that line. That's why I just wanted to ask it. The fear of losing eyes is also construed by Freud as a castration fear, a fear of losing one's manliness, losing one's potency. 
Okay. And remember that the classic text that I would recommend to with Uncanny is Oedipus the King. Oedipus is reborn in his father's persona. He loses his eyes. It is a good idea to read the Uncanny alongside Oedipus the King because there is an actual blinding in Oedipus and there is a constant to in a um, quarrel that Oedipus gets into with the blind fear, uh, Tiresias. A Tiresias asks Oedipus to see better. And Oedipus says that he has seen more than Tiresias since he has realized. It is ironic because it is only a few moments later that Oedipus will see that he has not seen that the woman he has been sleeping with was his mother and the children he has given birth to are his brothers and sisters. And therefore, what he should not have seen, he has seen. And therefore, he plucks out his eye. So the phobia of uh, losing one's sight should be uh, seen as metaphoric and not literally of eyes being plucked out. But Freud talked about this phobia as central to the European consciousness. Yes. Okay, okay. In that case, now I have to uh, actually give my closing remarks. You know, when uh, Nondimizik was addressing us, I was at once wondering at the range of scholarship and also empathizing with her because there was so much to say, which he could not <laughs> actually point out due to the lack of time. So she has given us a panoramic view of the representation of the uncanny by referring to both critical and creative texts. She has also connected the phenomenon of uncanny both to the psychological and the sociological dimensions. So I must thank her for this. You see, she has referred to not only text, an American text, but also what was very refreshing, she has referred to Bengali text, text by Ravindranath, Thanks by Trilokona, and we are really grateful for this to her. Actually, when I was listening to her, I was being reminded of another aspect of the uncanny, especially its literary and cultural representation. That is the faking of the uncanny. We, I was reminded of Toilo Chitre Bhut. Yes. Actually, yes. an uncanny almost eerie experience that turns out to be quite a scientific one. Mm. So, and you know, you know, people have not only experienced and experimented with the uncanny mm. in the 19th and the 20th century, this genre is very much the in thing even today. Absolutely. And that's why, that's why I think more than a closure being attempted, mm -hmm. the greatness of this session was the avoidance of closure. And at the same time, by implication, inspiration of independent thought among the members of the audience. So with this, we come to the end of this session. I must thank Professor Nondini Bhattacharya for enlightening us on this very, very interesting and important subject. And I must also thank the members of the audience who have stayed with us and who are actually helping us in bringing this online lecture series